everyone. I'm Bill Lacey with the Association for Corporate Health Risk Management, ACRM. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, this is going to be a capacity crowd, uh, but uh, we still have people on the on the road, so uh, don't be surprised if people come wandering in. Um, this topic was one that was started about a year ago, and uh, our background in looking at this is uh, intuitively, I believe in wellness. My background as a CFO, financial per person, uh, also being involved in running wellness initiatives, both with corporate as well as uh, uh, um, a wellness center. I believe it. The challenge, however, is is wellness getting the return on investment? Is wellness effectively working in the in the workforce? So right now, it's got it's got some scrutiny. There's uh, it's sitting under the microscope. Uh, I just heard the re new recent leader of the National Business Group on Health speak, and it's almost like they're going to be walking away from wellness. So it's uh, we wanted to look at this because wellness works. It, intuitively, it's a good thing, but. When we look at safety by comparison, why is safety so successful? It's been around for 100 years, regulation behind it, risk management tools. Why is safety so strong and working well and wellness, relatively speaking, which has been around for plus or minus 30 years, is a little more challenged. So that's how this all kind of came together, looking at safety and wellness. and. Uh, as, as we were pursuing this or studying this, we reached out to three Fortune 500 companies. How are you, how are you handling safety and wellness? Well, one company, Dow Chemical, these are all companies you're gonna know, they're large. We started our safety and wellness programs together back in the early 80s. Got lots of metrics and ways of measurement, it's, it's working well for you. Um, Safeway Supermarket. Who's ever been to a Safeway? Big, second largest supermarket chain in North America, over 100,000 workers. They have a safety and wellness, two separate departments, but they collaborate and seems to work effectively. Train Corporation, who's ever heard of Train? Well, Train, before they were acquired by Ingersoll Rand, was light years in front of many Fortune 500 companies when it came to wellness to the point where the CEO used to pull the wellness managers from the what, five different manufacturing plants around the country. They would have an offsite, talk about ideas. Ingersoll Rand comes in and the wind gets taken out of the sails and safety's strong, but wellness is weak. There's no interaction that's somewhat dysfunctional. So those are really the three models that are out there in the, in the marketplace. Let's bring it down to the middle market, the smaller companies. How do we make this work in, in these markets? And that's part of what the, the mission is for, for this workshop. We also, as we were developing this concept, have a relationship with the National Institute of Occupation Safety and Health, NIOSH. Who's heard of NIOSH? <clears throat> well, that's impressive. I was, uh, I was at a round table last year, two dozen of my closest friends from around the country. Um, IBM was there, Safeway was there, several universities, uh, big, big players. And uh, NIOSH had asked us to gather to look at how do we take all this great stuff that we've been doing since the 70s when we were founded and bring this information to the employer. Well, I felt a little out of place in that audience because the largest company we have in, in Akram is 30,000 employees. Well, I think the smallest company in that room was 80,000 employees. So it was like we were bringing in a whole different dimension to the conversation. And uh, one of the outcomes of that is, well, let's put together a symposium. So in early October, they're going to have a symposium. And after they heard what we were doing, they invited us to, to be a presenter. Um, so what we're looking for out of this session is we want to bring three stories you of how companies are looking at both safety and wellness and part of this is going to be in preparation for this same panel is going to go in front of NIOSH 
first international symposium. And when I say international, we're going to have millions of people at this, at this event. Uh, <laughs> who knows how many? But uh, anyway, a lot of, uh, so we're looking for a couple of things from it. One, it's an Akron workshop is two pieces. One, it's educational, and it's a moderated panel. So I'm going to be asking each of the panelists a question, a couple of questions, but we want to turn it to the audience for questions that you may have. You're going to have three somewhat disparate stories here. You've got a staffing agency, staffing company. You've got a major law firm. And you've got a little convenience store that you may have heard of that was kind enough to host us. Um, I'm, I'm being facetious. 23,000 employee convenience store. So you've you got three different industries, you've got three different approaches, three different sized companies. And uh, so we're going to go through those stories. I'm going to ask each of the panelists a couple of questions, but then I want to come back to, to the audience on, on this. Um, but that's the overview. I just have a couple quick slides. Ralph. Well, before we get started, uh, yes. for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ralph Bardew, wellness manager for Wawa. And in the spirit of wellness and safety, um, we're a safety organization, we're a wellness organization. Just want to share a quick wellness contact. Uh, please feel free to stand up at any point during this meeting if you choose. There's plenty of room on the perimeters, uh, obviously on the sides and the back. Restrooms are down to the right. In the spirit of safety, if we need to exit this building for any reason, uh, particularly emergency, there's an exit quickly out to the left or to the right. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, the uh, we we had that all planned, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, seriously, it's you can just tell the culture here at Wawa. I mean, it, it, this is this is what the company is is producing, whether it's an inside meeting, an outside meeting. So it's a, it's a good example of establishing a wellness, a wellness culture. Uh, ACRAM, the Association for Corporate Health Risk Management, we're a little over two years old. Uh, we were founded in uh, May of 2012. Uh, we're a pretty simple organization, simple meaning structure. Uh, it is employers that range in size up to 30,000 employees. We um, are set up in chapters because we want to create collaboration, plus there's a number of specific issues in, in a chapter, and I'll get back to that in a second. Also part of our membership, uh, we allow six different health insurance brokers or consulting firms to join ACRA because we see important collaboration and important advice from the consultant or broker. The other part of our organization is the vendor community, which uh, unlike many, many other associations out there, we limit it to one vendor per industry vertical. And we want that vendor, we vet them, we go through a quite a rigorous process. And these are uh, some of, we have two categories, national as well as local. Uh, in the audience, we've got a couple of folks here representing cancer treatment is here, ELAP, uh, Surgery Center Network is out of uh, Dallas, so they're not here today, but um, here with in spirit. Um, locally, we've got uh, Arlington is out of our Dallas, our DC chapter, and Roll Edge is, is Baltimore and, and uh, DC, and HOMAC is here locally in Fox Club. Um, so I want to thank all the sponsors, and this is where a lot of our ideas come from, because they're smart people. Some of them we like to call national thought leaders. Um, so today, it's, it's really simple, breaking down into two pieces. There's going to be a moderated panel. We're going to do that for about an hour, hour and a half. And it's going to be a combination of my questions to the panelists, but then I'm going to turn it to the audience. And then we break into what we call collaborative solution sessions. You'll notice that each of you are sitting at a table that has a particular number assigned to it. After our moderated panel, we're gonna, we're gonna break into groups, and we're gonna focus on these four specific topics. So for example, group one, which will be facilitated by Felicia, thank you Felicia, uh, is going to look at the three type, the different types of corporate cultures that exist. And you guys are gonna determine those corporate cultures, I'm not telling you what they are, but applying them to the three models that I just mentioned. 
the collaborative safety and wellness or integrated department, the two separate departments, but they collaborate, and then the third one is two uh, independent groups. And then we will have, you'll notice there are four easels around the room. Uh, each of the groups is going to assign a spokesperson, and he or she is going to uh, come up at the end of the session and is going to present the recommendations that the group came up with. And it just helps us to take the knowledge that we have gotten in the first half of the session and put it into action. Um, it's interesting because we all come from different backgrounds. Nobody's, a, nobody's an expert. And we're all different sized companies. We have different capacities, etc. cetera. Um, so we've got four great panels. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll start over to the right. But I encourage everybody, uh, Lauren, our membership coordinator, who is outside in the hallway, who's new to, to Akron, would have given you a, uh, a blue forward as well as uh, certain handouts that you would have walked in with. One had the agenda, but also each of the panelists, their bio is included in there and their particular employer's story. So we're not going to spend time with the panelists going through their story. We're going to give that you the opportunity to peruse that during the uh, presentation. But what we are going to do is get right down into the specific question. So I encourage you to, to review that information. Uh, but uh, just to quickly introduce Roy Fazio. Um, he's with Protocol Staffing. Felicia Smith is with the Templeton Foundation. And we've got a tag team here from Wawa. We've got both Rich Bressler <laughs> as well as Doug Schultz. Um, three things we're, we're looking for here. Uh, we're, we want to look at some of the lessons that have been learned from these, these different organizations in, in approaching safety and wellness. And, and when I say safety and wellness, we're also going to be looking at the new health law. Same thing as Obamacare, same thing as ACA, but I like to call it the health law because it's been passed. It's no longer an act. Uh, what challenges has that presented? Well, one you're going to hear is workers that are 30 hours or more on average per week, do I pay the penalty or do I offer them health insurance? Well, what if you're in the staffing agency, the staffing business, and you're deploying thousands of workers, some of whom are working over 30 hours a week? You could go from an 80-person firm to now several hundred, if not several thousand employees, all as a result of this new health law. Um, we also want to look at the opportunities, challenges by these three models. And of course, there's other models, but they, we're just pulling the three that we found in the Fortune 500. Um, this is information about the NIOSH event, which is where we're, gonna, we're taking our show on the road. Um, NIOSH is a division of the CDC. Because NIOSH is small, they're, they're, uh, they've engaged the National Institute of Health to, uh, to hold the, uh, the event. Yeah. Well, um, they're going to host the event, and uh, not, uh, the uh, uh, National Institute of Health apparently has a very large campus, so uh, if you are planning to go to the event, we need to find out specifically which building on that campus uh, is going to be housed. But information on your table is about nine, and I encourage you to, uh, to attend. I'll be attending the, the sessions. Uh, I think a couple others are planning to as well. Um, we've talked about the collaborative solution sessions. I just want to talk a little bit about ACRAM just for a second and then we'll go into the moderated panel. It'll give you a perspective. Um, we come together to find solutions. How do I contain healthcare costs? And we do that through education, we do it through collaboration, we do it through innovative methods, disruptive technology. We want to bring new ideas to the table. The same old, same old isn't working. We've got to come up with new ideas. Um, I've already gone through our, our model here. Our pillars, or what we look at as the five challenges that employers face. Now, my background is financial, CFO. I developed uh, what we call corporate-wide or enterprise-wide risk management for Pico Energy, which today is excellent. Uh, 
Uh, they're using the same policies, procedures that got developed back in the late 90s. Uh, it was a three-year process touching every department. Um, it was quite an extensive process. So I look at this from a risk standpoint, from an operational, from a financial, and we break it into five areas. Number one, introducing price transparency and quality metrics for healthcare services. It's a little strange when none of us really knows how much anything costs that we're going out to buy in the healthcare sector. We need to bring that information to us because today the employer is rapidly becoming what's known as the new payer in the marketplace. They're becoming self-funded. They're taking greater control over their healthcare spend. So if you are gonna go self-insured, how do you make that work better? We've done sessions on what are the stages of transitioning from fully insured to self-funded. And even if you are self-funded and you've been self-funded for years, you can learn things about that. Uh, after you are self-funded, what, what do we do next? And uh, those are some of the things that we're working on. Wellness, we've talked about that, and you'll see more. My background, how do we engage the CFO? How do we get the financial people to the table? If anybody has an idea, I would welcome it because I could, I could poll, I must talk to a, a CFO, banker, attorney every week. Why aren't you screaming about some of these issues? Well, somebody else is gonna fix it, right? Well, unfortunately not. Providing education, we're, we've got, been awarded a grant by the state of New Jersey. We'll be rolling out a series of professional certificates. More to come on that. Um, so as I said, we've got Four, four chapters, uh, six chapters actually, Philadelphia, D.C., Dallas, um, Chicago, Northern New Jersey, Baltimore. Um, each one of them has a little bit different market dynamic. Dallas, for example, is a bit, in some ways, more progressive than, than here. Um, so you've got companies with six employees who are self-insured. Well, who would ever think of that in this market? Um, <clears throat> the future for us, we got a few things percolating. First is we're developing these solutions, or I should say we are all developing these solutions, but let's put them out on a, on a web platform for people to go to, to have access to it. And uh, professional certificates, we need, we need to broaden our educational base as a, as a workforce. Um, and eventually when we have more chapters, we're gonna have regional and national conferences. So this kind of think tank isn't just happening in Philadelphia, but it's a larger, larger breadth of, of the country. Membership, you have information inside your pamphlet on membership. We have, we have a sliding scale depending upon employer size, and it's uh, anywhere from $99 a year up to $1,500 a year. Um, we, we believe it's, it's very competitive uh, relative to other associations out there in the marketplace. Here's some of our upcoming events, uh, just to, to make sure you mark these down on your calendar. If you're interested in medical travel, medical tourism, both domestic as well as international, jump on a train and come to D.C. September 24th, hosted by the Inter-American Development <coughs> Bank. Um, the, uh, the NIOSH Symposium. Oh, we, we, we have a variety of strategic partnerships uh, with various organizations. Now, the University of Michigan has a group called VBIT, Value-Based Insurance Design. Who has heard of that? It sounds like a neat concept. We have introduced it. It was at one of our first meetings. So we've been having constant interaction with them. They've invited me out to their annual conference, and, and maybe after that, we're going to announce a, a, a more formalized relationship with them. Um, financial Executive Mixer. Get your CFO out to this event. We're trying to get private equity, investment banks, commercial banks, mischief night, and if you're not from the Philadelphia area, it is the 30th of October. Um, the next morning, Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, we are going to have a public entities event, and we're thankful that uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America will be presenting. So we're looking at municipalities, labor unions, school districts. Whew, boy, it is tough to get them to start to look at some of these, these strategies. But uh, lots of things can happen. Um, then in November, uh, Templeton 
is going to host us. Thank you, Felicia. We are going to have our next session on accountable care organizations and health information exchanges, which we had back in early April. It was a terrific event, and uh, lots of different ideas spawned out of that, so we're now taking it to the next level. Um, so that's going to happen in mid-November. We're planning for uh, uh, first quarter's already ha uh, January 12th, um, if, you're, if you're interested in a SHRM organization. Princeton SHRM has invited us up to be keynote speakers for their January dinner, January 12th. It's at Princeton High. Uh, it's just one that's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, so these are these are all these slides are in your possession. Uh, lots of tiny print here, so <clears throat> you'll be challenged by that. So thank you all for for uh, listening on on the overview. What I'd like to do now is uh, pause a second. Did anybody have any questions about acting? What we're trying to do and. and uh, where we're going. If not, I want to start peppering this panel here with <laughs> questions. What I'm going to do is ask them one or two questions, and then I'm going to turn to the audience and see if you have any questions. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to then go back and continue asking questions, because if you've ever been to a conference from, with me, I uh, like to ask questions. Um, so first thing, where I'd like to start is, uh, I'd like to start down with Mr. Fazio. And uh, just as some background here, um, the staffing industry is affected by more than any other industry by the new health law. Over 96% of large companies in the US use staffing services regularly for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, it, do I need, want to do a new hire here or for seasonal reasons? So it's an important part of our, our labor uh, pool out there. But beginning January 1st, 2015, just, just a few short months from now, something big's going to happen. The new health law is going to require employers to offer health insurance to any employees that are working over 1,560 hours a year, 30 hours on average per week. Uh, health insurance, or they're going to sustain a, a penalty, which is going to be somewhere around $3,000, and a CFO is probably going to look at that a little bit higher than $3,000, it could be maybe $5,000, depending upon uh, total, total cost. But in addition, what's going to happen to our employee when we say, you got to go out to the exchange, you got to go buy this health insurance, and oops, it's going to cost me 12000 a year. So me, as an employer, I'm going to pay three. The employee may get some subsidy, but he or she may be putting a $10,000 bill. Um, so they're not going to be too happy. So now we look at the staffing business, and compliance staffing agencies will incur this new cost of doing business. But. The question I have for Roy is protocol staffing, 80 employees, as we see in our handout. Why did this really matter to you? And if I look at it from a financial person's standpoint, you suddenly went from 80 person firm to maybe three or 400, maybe a couple thousand employees. I mean, in some ways, that could be crippling. So Roy, what did you do? Did you shut down your business, or, or did you come up with another way to, to work with that? Well, I'd be very remiss, I have to um, mention one thing, because my marketing director would very, uh, be very concerned if I didn't correct him and say that our, our, name, our, our name of our company is Protocol Group. Okay. Because of the five entities that we have, and we're not just in the staffing work, so. I, I apologize, but I, I did get I, that in. I, I, I would be very remiss, especially in. if this is on, on a tape, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is... It's, it's that was a, another plant, by the way. It's a, yeah. The marketing director told me to use the other name. <laughs> to see if I would respond. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> now, it was a... I, I think as a segue into answering, um, saying I, I think it's important to know that um, about 15 years ago, I had started a national trade organization for our industry, and, and the model is very important to understand, too, because we 
we share best practices because the model is we have non-competing companies around the country that are very similar to us, independent um, companies in the staffing industry. Um, and about two years ago, uh, we started to really uh, um, uh, get connected with this uh, new Affordable Care Act that was, was coming our way. And one of our member companies happened to be in Massachusetts. And for any of you that don't know, Massachusetts has, health, has had health care reform for several years now. Um, he was uh, well connected with uh, an attorney that was on um, um, in Romney's administration and began educating on, us on what was to come. Um, but with that being said, you know, leading into you know answering your question directly, but I thought it was important to know that little background is that um, knowing the law and what was coming forth, we had to, we knew the impact on our businesses that was going to be significant. I mean, for, for protocol, it meant uh, well over over a hundred thousand dollars in in costs. We we employed over eight thousand people last year. Out of over that eight thousand people, about four hundred and seventy five. Are, are going to be eligible, meaning that they worked over 1,560 hours during the year. Um, and we got the message from our, uh, our, our, our broker that our, our rates were going to go up 30 some percent. So, um, and we're already paying, uh, I don't even remember the number, but I think we're already paying uh, well over $350 for single coverage. So if you just figure out the numbers, and you multiply that time. We don't know how many people out of that 475 will take the insurance. I mean, that's another unknown. I mean, we're, our responsibility is we'll have to offer the insurance, and um, beginning October 15th, we'll have to, or beginning in October, we'll have to send out letters to all those employees and, and see who responds. So uh, the significance of it is a really a, a strong financial impact, and, you know, and, and even beyond that, how do you take that cost and pass it on to the customers? So in concern of our customers, we had to really look at how can we keep our costs minimal, whatever the pass-through would be to the customers. So um, end result is, is that we, uh, we were able to, as a, an association, we call it the Affiliated Staffing Group, is our organization, we found a, um, a, an organization out in Cleveland, Ohio, that forms offshore uh, self-health insurance capitals. And uh, the concept is that we're all in this big cell, so to say, of, of the captive, and each one of our member companies is, has their own cell. Um, but bottom line and result, you know, and you as a, a CFO in the background can understand this, our, our costs are now, because we're in this captive, will go down to anywhere from 175 to 200 dollars per month since we went took this strategy. So I hope that if that's uh, answers uh you're gonna, you're gonna get a great month. big gold star on that, probably from your marketing person. That's a terrific message and, and I'm sure your CFO is now gonna gonna sing the high praise. But that's the type of innovation that we're, we're as an organization are looking to to bring out into the into the marketplace. Ideas like this. Now shifting from an 80 person with a several hundred person entity. Let's come to the other extreme. Now we've got 23,000 employees. We've got over 600 stores. We're in you know, eight states? Six. six states? Eight in a little bit? No. Okay, six, six for right now. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the challenge, and this question's to, to Rich, uh, what is the challenge in trying to drive safety into the culture, but in stores and places that it's so decentralized, there's many employees that you probably are lucky if you see once a year. So what are some of the challenges you're facing from a safety standpoint at Guava? I mean, as far as safety, uh, I don't want to stand anybody more. As far as safety, some like of the challenges the there, I mean, we've been working on safety for 15 years. Uh, and 
they've done a good job at getting that communicated out to all the stores by setting the right standards, by following up, coaching, holding people accountable. But where the challenge really is, is getting the wellness message out there. Mm. And that's really what I'm, I'm focused on now. Doug, Doug focuses on safety and I've moved over into the wellness team. But probably the biggest challenge, because what we try to do is take our key learnings and everything we developed that was successful in safety and apply it to the wellness uh, portion of our business and, 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 and help our associates and stores develop a culture of wellness in the stores. So in safety, we, we had a, 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 a six key components that we used to really uh, get the, the, the culture developed in, uh, around safety. So we're trying to take what we can from those six key components and apply it to wellness. And probably the biggest challenge is taking the accountability piece. One of our, um, uh, one of the six key components of one of our principles in safety is working safely as a condition of employment. So that enables us to hold our associates accountable for working safely. And if they don't, they may not work for us anymore. And the other thing that ties in there is our values. One of our, our core values is value people. So in order to hold somebody accountable for working safely, I can come to them and say, Sabrina, I care so much about you that I won't allow you, I, I just, I'd rather you not work for us than work for us and get injured. So you can tie in the principle of working safely as a condition of, of employment you can tie in the, the key component of holding people accountable, and you can also then, um, uh, uh, just drew a blank there, so what, what, what were the three, so the accountability, the, and, and basically holding you accountable, and change and manage that behavior to, to, to have Sabrina working safely. With wellness, we can't do that. I mean, we can't say, you know, you need to become more healthier or you're not going to work here because we care too much about that. It really doesn't translate over into wellness. Now, in terms of accountability and wellness, we're, we're taking some steps in terms of some of the things we require people. For example, we're doing things uh, like most companies are doing around um, uh, penalties for not going through the biometric screen. So we can manage that because we're contributing to the benefits and, and we may require them to contribute more if they aren't participating in all our programs. But that doesn't uh, uh, really encourage the, the associate to become more healthy. Now on the other hand, so, so we need to find a way of replacing that key component in, in safety into wellness. And where we head is in the inspire others. One of our, our uh, we call it the fit to fly five, is inspire others. And so while I can't hold you accountable for becoming well, I can inspire you to become well. So one, for example, one of the programs we have is, uh, I was talking about earlier this morning, is a program we have, a uh, Gold Medal Life Award, where we uh, recognize an associate or a group of associates for uh, going above and beyond and embracing wellness, and at the same time, inspiring others to do the same. Uh, and, and our most recent one, I'll cut this short, I'm almost done, uh, our most recent one was an associate that works in, in corporate that had a goal, uh, had, had, and was inspired to do it between his wife and some information he got from his doctor. So went and, and made a commitment, he was going to work with his wife, start working out, eating better. At the same time, inspired over a dozen associates that he worked with to make changes of their own. So in a two year time span, he's taken off 135 pounds. His wife wouldn't tell us how much she lost. She wanted to keep that as her. She's lost a fair amount as well. But when we gave the award to him, the cafeteria was full uh, of associates coming to celebrate with him. And three of the associates of the over a dozen that were inspired shared their stories, how they were inspired by Chris. Uh, and I, I know, and by talking to people after the thing uh, uh, broke up, there were many people there that were inspired above and beyond the 12 that, that Chris touched directly. So that's the type of things we're working on this case. So we can't hold you accountable for being well, but we can inspire you. So hopefully that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I mean, it is quite a challenge with, uh, with having so many, so many stores being decentralized, trying to drive culture, ideas, uh, solutions from the corporate, corporate world. Steve, you have, you have okay, a question? question. It, you know, it, it's, 
we talked about this before the meeting. It's, it's interesting how companies will track two ways. And this is the very topic of this seminar. You know, you've got a work comp mentality. It's traditionally safety. Um, there's control of the employee and the care. It's, it's more of a, a, a much more managed process. Sure. On the other side of the house, you have benefits. It typically falls to HR. It's more of a comforting thing. And, and if we find even large, well-run companies, it's a completely different mindset relative to work comp and employee benefits. And you know, you, you, safety and wellness are sort of on the, typically fall to either side of the house. How, did, how are you structurally set up? To, to well, it's interesting. That? Our CFO also oversees the benefits team and the safety team. It's, it, it's all the same group. So, our CFO is on board. I, I mean, I, I think you make happy this morning. Yeah, yeah. She'll um, pop in a little bit too. So what's that? Yeah. She'll pop in a little bit to say Okay, oh, great. So, Kathy will be in talk a little bit about it as well. But that helps when you have everybody <coughs> operating under the, the same umbrella. And then the other thing that, that we work collaborative on a number of things. And one of the things we realize is as company owners, because we're, we're an employee uh, owned company, as company owners, it really doesn't make a difference in our profits, whether it's costing us on the workers' comp side or it's costing us on the, the medical side, because we're self-insured on both. Mm -hmm. So that also gives you an, an added incentive to work together. What can I do to help Doug? And, and how can we combine our messages to get double exposure as well? So we're, we're driven, besides I like Doug, <laughs> we're driven to work together. Uh, just the way we're structured organizationally, as well as uh, uh, the, the, the drive from the employee stock ownership. Do you have two separate plan administrators for comp versus uh, benefits? Yes. Okay. Just jump in a little yeah, bit. Yeah, please. Um, please. I think, you know, even though, to go further into your question, we are two separate entities, but like Rich said, we work collaboratively a lot on different things. There's certainly a lot of challenges out there. Um, you know, looking at loss from a uh, total perspective rather than in those buckets. Um, but I think one of the things that we see for both safety and wellness is one, management support, which is huge. I mean, we have that from the beginning uh, across the board from our, from our management team. And also, uh, one of the things we always talked about in safety when we started that was you need to know the why behind it. And I think uh, the wellness team does a great job of that, and the safety team, we try to get the why so it becomes more personal for them rather than you have to do this. You know, there's a why behind the story, and, and you know, it's for their, again, it goes back to our values of valuing people, and it, it's, it's deeper than just compliance and uh, you know, saving, saving the dollar on the top end. It's, it's really trying to get it more personal, and the why, I think, sometimes helps <coughs> get that across as well. That's a good point. Thank you, Doug, and th thank you, Rich. Um, to, so we, we've, heard, we've heard from a staffing group <coughs> with five different verticals that they're providing staffing, which can be several thousand employees every week, <coughs> to the convenience store, which is a variety of different type of employees. I mean, you get the worker inside the store, you got uh, distribution, there's, there's a, a, you have the headquarters, etc. cetera. Um, but now we've got an, a, an interesting dynamic or element into our panel here. Felicia Smith, um, some of you may have heard her speak in, in other workshops, but she brings quite an interesting dimension, very, uh, very experienced. And she, her, spanning her career, she has had experience in manufacturing and industrial and has taken that into the white collar world, a major law firm, and now more recently into the Templeton Foundation. But, uh, one of the things I want to I want to present to Felicia, but before I ask the question, is uh, we're going to talk about what got learned in the industrial side and got applied both safety and wellness into uh, into the white collar. But uh, two two uh, small anecdotes for you. Number one, Felicia shared an interesting story with me that uh, one of the firms she was working with that uh, the big learning experience with her was uh, it was a manufacturing facility and you know, manufacturing you think would be something on the forklift or working with this particular uh, press or whatever that case may be but actually it was a office work that was their largest claim and uh, back in the old days uh, when you pulled a file drawer out 
there may not have been a counterweight to it. And that file drawer could end up meaning the file goes over. Well, they had a temporary worker on staff, and file drawer is out. I think she sat down, and it came crashing over, and it, unfortunately, it was, it was, uh, it was personally, a, a, the injury was uh, you know, very sad to hear, but it was, uh, but it was their largest claim for, for the year. And uh, so, an interesting anecdote. And the other one was when I sat with NIOSH, and I was, uh, we were walking through some of the stories. We, these weren't the only ones we had, we had others. And, and I paused it at Felicia's story, and I said, a law firm, I mean, what work comp is there for a law firm? Well, who wants to take a guess at what NIOSH said to me? The number one work comp claim in a law firm is stress. I mean, it couldn't have been, I couldn't have paused for a second when asking that question and she jumped right in to say, it's stress. That is our number one work comp issue that gets presented. Well, that was an education for me. But so looking to you, Felicia, what uh, over the course of your, and doesn't she look 30? Uh, over your, your course of uh, your career, looking at these various industries, what, what did you learn in the manufacturing industrial sector that could get applied later to one of the largest law firms in Philadelphia from both the wellness and safety standpoint? That's a really interesting question. And I, honestly, I can't tell you that um, when I first came into the wellness space at the law firm, and I worked at Fox Rothschild for almost eight years, and so in the spirit of full disclosure, I've been with the Templeton Foundation a year now, but we have about 90 people there and have a fully insured program, so wellness is not a focus of where I am, I say yet, because they don't know what they're going to get in just a short period of time. Um, however, um, it really wasn't a focus at the law firm either when I started, at all. It wasn't on my radar. It wasn't anything I thought about. And it was sort of an evolution. And when it did become very clear that all the changes that we put in, in terms of trying to control our costs, and I joined the law firm in 2000, uh, early, just I think January of 2007. So the first year was great. And then, of course, the bottom fell out in 2008. And in that first year, we had a 26% increase in premiums. And our um, total medical dental vision package was already close to $10 million at that point, just by virtue of the size uh, that we were and the richness of the plans. You know, our, know any lawyers, you know they're a little high maintenance and sort of the world revolves around them and they're entitled to this and you know nobody paid attention to this for years and years and years and all of a sudden it was like oh my god you know we can't sustain these kind of increases. So we did everything. We did absolutely everything that you could possibly think of doing um, initially in terms of not plan design changes necessarily, because they still wanted their cake and eat it too, you know, no, no, no major changes in terms of deductibles or co-insurance or any of that, but there were other things that were sort of low-hanging fruit. Uh, first of all, when I came there, because their growth had been through acquisition over the years, they never bothered to consolidate the plans. So if they had a company, um, a law firm in San Francisco, they merged with, you know, Nobody wanted to change doctors, and it was just too much trouble, so all that was left over. So we had the most Byzantine kind of situation with all these different plans and all these different um, providers and all these different uh, enrollment dates. Our poor uh, benefits administrator was doing open enrollment all year long, just keeping up with this craziness. So, you know, obviously that was number one, consolidate the plans. And we managed to do that for all of our 14 offices with one exception, and that was Pittsburgh. We wound up going to national carrier uh, Aetna, and we had the uh, Independence Blue Cross and Aetna, who were sort of neck to neck. And, uh, you know, it was kind of nice to see a little competition there, I have to say. Um, but we decided on Aetna, and we did keep uh, Highmark Blue Cross in Pittsburgh because the the Aetna didn't have enough of a, of a penetration in that marketplace, and we couldn't get 
you know, in network uh, benefits sufficient for that group. So at least we went down to two plans. So that was sort of the easiest. Then we put in a health savings account, a health reimbursement account. And what didn't make sense to me, is out of that uh, group of, at the time, it was almost 1,000 employees, half of whom were partners, about 250 of them were equity partners. These are owners of the firm. For them not to have had an HSA is crazy. They were, I mean, it just didn't make any sense. So all those basic <coughs> things, without even thinking about wellness at that point, we saved $1.2 million in year one. That was extraordinary, really. But the problem with these things is, you know, they're one-time sort of changes. You know, we weren't going to get that kind of mileage going forward. So what did you do for me lately? Which I bet you was the next question in the next I'm sorry. following year. What did you do for us lately? Oh, you did the one point two million in year one and what's year two? They expect be? that kind of you know sustainable. Two point four? But the one thing that it did get us was credibility, I have to say, because unlike, you know, my panel mates here who all said the most important component is sort of leadership and buy-in from the top. I had none of that. <laughs> uh, you know, I hate to say this. I'm mean, the great people, believe me, but this was not on their radar, and especially not in a recession. You know, the last thing. I mean, they sort of. I guess the best thing you could say about our leadership at that point was they stayed out of HR's way. That's the best way of saying it, and they didn't give us a budget. So what we had to do was to shift. Well, they did have a wellness program. Okay, that's what they called it. Their wellness program consisted of a $100 stipend that all employees would get one year to do something wellness related. Honestly, we could have given every employee an apple a day and said, here's our wonderful wellness program. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. Most people use it to offset gym membership or to buy sneakers. That was another hugely, I called it the sneaker program. By the way, I bought my own sneakers. They never saw the light of day. They were still at the bottom of my closet. <laughs> so, it obviously had nothing to do with wellness, but the beauty of that was that that $100 per person all of a sudden got me a budget that I could go to the executive committee and say, I don't need any money. We're just going to take the money we have and we're going to shift it into different programs. And what we did is we started, because frankly I didn't know what I was doing. I never run a wellness program before. When I worked at the manufacturing company, this was back in the 1980s, I worked there for 10 years, but, you know, wellness was just not the thing. The, the um, level of uh, cost for medical programs was reasonable. It wasn't wonderful, uh, but it was certainly manageable, nothing like what happened in you know, the decades to come. So, um, so we shifted those costs and really first leveraged our carriers. That was, I think, the best place to start because companies like IBC or Aetna or Highmark They've been doing this for years, and there were so many things embedded in our program that nobody knew about, nobody was highlighting, nobody was really using, and so we created a campaign. And I thought, okay, how do we sell this? And that's where my industrial experience kind of came in, because I remember even safety, when I worked for an industrial equipment distributor, it's sort of a given. I know it's part of Wawa's culture. It was part of ours as well, but it gets stale. You really have to sort of beat the drums every day and make it fun even and things like that. And I learned um, during my time there of what worked in the safety context. And I think just naturally I started applying it to a law firm context where the lawyers were not just the partners, but if, if that doesn't trickle down from the top, I can't tell you that half our workforce were attorneys, that even the associates were really bought into this at all. I mean, it was very nice, it was fluff, it was one of those HR programs, but, you know, this was not going to be revolutionary or change anything. But what they forgot about was that there were half of the group are not attorneys, are staff members. And, you know, I thought, okay, I can't convince this group, but I know that this group is very price sensitive. They come from all kinds of industries. This is not going to be a foreign language to them and let's build on what we have. And really that's where we started. So we branded it, you know? We called it Fox Fit and Well. Um, we created Fox University. Or did we get mileage with FU? You can't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but those things kept it at the forefront, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was, and then 
I thought, okay, from a cultural point of view, what can we build on and play on? Lawyers are terribly stressed out, but they're also inherently very competitive. I mean, that's sort of part of their DNA. So we thought contests, you know, all that kind of thing, and also incentive rewards. I mean, we didn't want to make it punitive. We didn't want to sort of, you know, it has to be voluntary. It has to be something that people feel makes sense for them to go in. And if you do it right, it can be infectious. Uh, it's, you know, I am so convinced that this works because honestly, if it could work in our environment, I can't imagine any place it can't work. And we started our program in um, 2009 with just the shift of budget and a very small, we created a pledge and we said, you know, these are the kinds of things you have to do. Um, and, and so we looked at from the little bit of data that we were able uh, to get from our prior uh, fully insured programs as to where were some of our high cost areas. We also found that nobody was doing preventive stuff. So we started giving points for these things. And at the end of the year, if you did all, you know, at least two activities a year and you, you did the preventive service, and you participated on a wellness committee. It was a mixed bag because we knew it couldn't be one size fits all. Different people are motivated differently. And we had firm-wide programs that were run out of Philadelphia, and then we had local programs. And that was a huge component because what resonates in San Francisco, which was yoga, they loved yoga, God bless them, we had yoga going all year. In Bucks County, their idea of recreation is going together to, for happy hour. That, you know. is, that, so, is that where the $100 went? <laughs> <laughs> so but you know, interesting thing about, about Bucks County, I just want to make, uh, this never would have occurred to me in a million years. The local committees created what programs they thought would resonate for their groups. And they asked us if they could use part of their budget for a counselor to come in and help with elder care issues. And I thought, I, I mean, it just never, you know, it never resonated to me under the umbrella of wellness or that that might be something, but the demographics in that group, that affected a lot of people and they were really stressed out and, and it worked like magic and it was so well received that we actually did several sessions and then some of our other offices asked for that as well. So, and uh, you know, in West Palm Beach, they, they decided they want salad uh, Wednesdays. They got together on Wednesdays, everybody bought a component and there was another wonderful little thing about that where these people never sat and ate together, all of a sudden they were sitting and eating together. Uh, which, you know, so it's not just about wellness, it's the cohesiveness, and then we start having these contests of, of walking miles, and a lot of it was for charity. I mean, I would take too much time to give you really nut and bolt components. But uh, in preparation for this meeting, I had lunch with the, um, with the benefits administrator at Fox this week still maintain contacts, they're you know, wonderful people. And she told me, and I was, honestly, I was fell on my chair, 75% participation in the program. And uh, to me, I never, I mean, I thought if you get 50, that would be extraordinary. But they're up to 75 now, mm -hmm. and for the last two years, their renewals have been under 5%. In fact, she said they're tracking at 3.6% for next year. And their bill now, because they've grown so significantly, they've done some major acquisitions, is getting close to $18 million a year of benefit costs. So you can imagine the competitive edge that this gives them vis-a-vis -vis other law firms who aren't doing this. And when we started, I remember talking to a group of um, heads of HR law firms here in Philadelphia and told them that you know, we, we, we were taking all these measures, we went to a self-insurance program, we created an HSA, an HRA, we consolidated benefits, and the next step was wellness program. And they all looked at me, with lawyers? You know, <laughs> good luck, you tell us how that works out, you know? And, and interestingly enough, of course, all the large firms have it now, and not only that, but they all contacted Fox and said, okay, we're ready to listen. How did you do this? So to me, that was validation that we were absolutely on the right track. So lawyers are people too, then. Is what you're <laughs> Some of them. I'm a lawyer myself. So I can, you know. Well, Ralph, it's a good thing that Wawa was able to come up with a Wawa University and didn't have the same challenges. Good point. That Fox yes. did, launching there. Uh, but uh, great stories. Thank you all. Now.
before I go to further questions, I'm curious, anyone in the audience, uh, thoughts, burning issues uh, that you may have for the panelists? You know, I just had um, a question, Felicia, your pledge. What was in that pledge? I didn't bring it with me, but I can get it to you if you'd like. The reason we created a pledge was because we were struggling with how to track you know, exactly what was being done. We figured, um, and it's ironic, you know, what, what kind of incentives could we give that would make sense? Now, in most organizations, uh, the first year I think we gave $250, then we kept upping it, and actually went up to 500 before we eliminated that whole model of giving money at the end, and we went to uh, outsource it. In the last year that I was there, there was a program called Vitality that does the tracking, um, you know, it's a completely different model, and I think it's really serving very, very well because it's very customizable. But at the beginning, the struggle that we had was figuring out, you know, how, what were we, the expectations of the things we wanted um, the participants to do, and also how to track that they were doing it. So we came up with the idea of a pledge, uh, which was sort of a, you know, made it look fancy and all that, uh, we gave it to everyone, and the pledge was that they were really going to um, participate in the Fox Fit and Well program and take their health seriously and be a champion of you know of that kind of thing. A little preamble there, and then we started listing all of the th things that would give you credit towards that money at the end of the year, and it was a mix of things. We wanted one preventive item for you to do. I'm trying to recall now, um, we had. Again, if you participate in the committee, because we had local committees and we had a firm wide committee, you got credit for that. If you did a walk for you know, either charity or for some other thing, we, we allowed that. Um, there was a number of the uh, sort of the activities at each of those locations. So I think we had five items. We thought, you know, that's not overwhelming because it would be difficult to track, and you don't come out full force, and we didn't know how it was going to work. So then they'd sign that pledge and they would send those pledges in at the end of the year to HR and you know, we put them in an Excel spreadsheet and then we kind of knew. Now eventually it became much more sophisticated, but the pledge, the concept of it did work. So you said that you had 75% participation and yes. the costs were down about 5%. How do you, or who, who measures this? So what are the metrics you're, the Fox is using? to measure dollars spent in dollars as to, you know, what the cost benefit is. You know, are we using an outside consultant? Is Vitality doing this for them? It's, How it's a measure, mixed bag. Who's doing the metrics for the program? It's a mixed bag. Um, obviously, one is strictly participation rates, who signs up for the program. And for everybody that signs up, we started giving uh, initially a Fitbit zip this was a few years ago, which was, that was the, you know, this look. I think the first one was a tracker we you had on your shoe, because we had this walking program. Uh, and then we did this Fitbit zip, and now uh, Ann was telling me that it was a new device, I guess, you wear them on your, on your wrist. So participation was one metric. But way beyond that, the beauty of a program like Vitality, or, you know, any of those competitors, we looked at Virgin uh, program as well at the time, was you know, the fact that you'd start with a baseline. So everyone had to do biometric testing and had to do a health risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So that, so that um, vitality, it was done through that system, were able to get a starting point of people's numbers as they started, because outcomes was a big deal for us you know, eventually. Um, so that we could see, is this having any real effect in terms of changing some of the, of the basic, um, you know, things that we were looking to change, blood pressure, weight, and Vitality gives you what they call a sort of a health score that's compared to your age. So, you know, I'm, I've just turned 60, for example. Thank you about that third comment, mm -hmm. right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, I may be 60 in, in age, but my health score could be 65, you know, or it could be 50. I mean, and that's a real wake up call for people when you tell them something like that. So what happens is each year, Vitality is again, remeasuring those items 
And then that's how we're tracking, you know, all those metrics getting in the direction that we need them to be, if you will. And those things are obviously because we're self-insured, there was a, a eventually since 2009, there's real data that we're able now to obtain on the types of claims, chronic diseases, all of that. So, so that's how we're tracking the effectiveness of the program. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, I'm gonna swing it there. Oh, Mary. Um, I have a question for the panel and for even any other employer in the room. Where do you um, feel that wellness or even benefit design fit into the acquiring and retention of employees? Because I seem to think that employees really don't even know what the benefits are so do you use it as a kind of a, um, a tool to help get an employee to sign on with you or to stay with you, or is it something that's a benefit they realize after they're on board? Who wants to take that easy one? Well, I can tell you at the law firm, you know, there's all these things that um, they market in terms of sort of distinguishing themselves uh, you know, how many women partners they have, uh, what their, um, they tell flexible work arrangements, and you know, that they have a robust part-time program. They're trying to attract a whole host of uh, people. And those are very important to both incoming attorneys and, um, and for retention purposes, because culture is huge. I mean, you know, there's inherent stress in the job and the striving for billable hours, but if you have sort of a, I guess culture is the best way to say it, but you have an environment that values the person and all of that, I think you get a tremendous amount of mileage out of that. And we won, starting in 2010, um, a gazillion really, all over the country, uh, all kinds of wellness awards because people were so fascinated that in an environment as lawyers, it was really quite <coughs> unique and also without initially top management support, now they are champions. They all have those these bands and they're all, you know, <laughs> which is wonderful. It's exactly what I had hoped would happen. Um, so I do think that a young person coming out of law school these days is going to look at all those factors and if they feel that, that there's a genuine interest in them and that there are all kinds of activities that are done at the local level, at the firm-wide level, I hope it, you know, gives them a, a real edge, and I certainly think it does. And I would speak for Wawa. Um, we're an employer of choice in our industry, and benefits is quite one of the big reasons, one of the main reasons why, because in our industry, typically at store level, that level of associate typically doesn't have benefits available to them. So as a result, our turnover in an industry that's around 250% is below 50%. And I, I haven't heard the most recent numbers. The last I heard was around two associates out of every 100 applicants get hired from us. So, and it really does play a huge role uh, in, in, in that piece. Roy, did you want to add anything else? Um, because I'm not every day in our, our HR department, it's been probably a little more difficult for me to say this, but um, I know our, our HR director has been with us over 25 years, I've tried close to 30 years now. And I, I think she makes a big difference in that. Uh, she really makes the culture of the organization. Uh, uh, in terms of our benefit packages, when they're offered or, or spoken to uh, our full-time employees, I know we talk about it. You know, I don't know how we do it in the, in the branches when we hire some of the associates or the contract or the, the temporary staff. It's out there, so a little, little more difficult for me to, mm -hmm. to give you a, a detailed answer. Well, I want to switch back to Wawa a second. Kathy uh, just walked into the room, and as you heard before, <coughs> human resources and finance. Uh, Good morning, everyone. First, I want to apologize for how I'm dressed. <laughs> I truly forgot I was coming here this morning when I got up and went to my closet, because um, I would have definitely dressed up for you. We are a casual work environment here at Wawa, so this is pretty much how I do come to work every day. But I honestly would have dressed up for you this morning. <laughs> so apologizing for that first off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As I saw wrap, I'm like, ooh, a lot more formal than I thought. Um, so welcome to Wawa. I'm grateful, like Sam said, you're grateful that you were all able to join us here today. Um, it's a great topic, and um, you have two great associates here to give you the Wawa point of view, among others in the room as well. 
And when you talk about safety and wellness, we've been through that journey. So we started our safety initiative here, I'd say 2002 with DuPont. I guess you're going into all that conversation or not. We're in about 2002, and wellness started five or six years later. And what I will tell you is that we've been down both paths. I would say that they're very similar. I'll tell you that the safety journey is a lot easier. You can fire people for not working safely. You can't fire people for eating a cheesecake and ice cream. So the wellness journey will take a lot longer. It's a much tougher journey, and it's one that we started and we were, we're fully engaged on and committed to. I don't want to take any time from your agenda. I know it's a full day, and I, I just really want to welcome you all and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be better dressed next time. <laughs> I wanted to I want to go back to Roy for a second because you touched on an interesting comment there. Roy's got in his staffing group, he's deploying workers into five different verticals, right, Roy? I mean it's uh, healthcare, industrial, office. From a safety standpoint, how do you manage safety issues at your company level when you have workers going into environments that you may not have any control of it. It's, uh, it's a big challenge and it could be a, a big number on the um, on the financials if um, your workers' comp insurance increased quite a bit. But uh, our, our HR director does a fabulous, fabulous job. She probably spends 30% of her day or week um, you know, really focusing on workers' comp claims that come into the company. And when we bring in a new customer, one of the um, uh, uh, important pieces is that she goes out to uh, to visit the location. Um, you know, interesting enough, I was talking to uh, uh, to Doug and uh, uh, Rich earlier, and I said two of our two lo two of our large customers are actually suppliers to uh, to Wawa. One of them does all the uh, the bakery on the bakery in uh, down in Vineland, the Salem County area, and the other one is Taylor Farms, which does all the produce and. You know, as far as we might have over 300 people there a day, and Omni Baker, we have over 200 people. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, with, um, with workers' comp, they're not at our location, so we, we have to do a, a very good job with educating our customers. Um, um, after we, we, we agree that we're going to service them, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's important to us. I mean, if, you know, there might be have significant business for us, but if we, if our HR director goes in there and identifies that there's this strong risk for uh, for safety issues there, we're not going to take them as a, as a as a customer. So um, I think it's a big tribute to her, and I think our process is that anytime we bring in a new account, especially if there's a lot of uh, uh, um, unskilled labor workers working there, we we do a visit to our customer, and we we actually do a tour of their facility and talk with their HR and their safety director. <coughs> Switching back to, to Wawa, we heard- Because we're self-insured also yeah. in workers' comp. Mm -hmm. And this year, I think as a comment, we took a lot more, <laughs> we took a different program. We were involved in some captives, and this year we took more risk. So even now, we have to be even more aggressive in managing our, mm -hmm. our claims. Very good points. And uh, it, playing off of Kathy's comment uh, uh, that you can fire somebody from safety, but looking at wellness inside of Wawa from a, from a cultural and a development standpoint, um, you have a program called the Corporate Athlete Program. Yes. Uh, Rich or Doug, can you guys walk us through what, how that program works? Sure. Anybody in here familiar with Corporate Athlete? Human Performance Institute? Pardon? From the Human Performance yes. Institute? Yes, down in the land of Florida. Um, I'm going to say three years ago, our CEO, uh, Chris Tyson, was looking for a way to, to improve his energy and performance and came across the Human Performance Institute's Corporate Athlete Program. So it's a two and a half day program. You go down to Orlando, Florida, and they, they their focus is on energy for, for performance. And they focus not only on the physical aspects, but emotional, mental, uh, as well as what they uh, categorize as spiritual. It's really about purpose. Why are we doing what we're doing? And by Focusing on all four of those dimensions because they're all connected and giving some strategies and principles and practices to put in place, it allows you to show up and, and have the energy you need for the people that you care about, which for Chris it was about his, 
his family, and, and as well as Wawa. So it's a great program to kind of get you to really start with, okay, what's my purpose? Who is it that I really want to be for the people I care about? Came back, made a huge difference. It's like, you know, so many nice side effects as well. A lot of people think, you know, I want to lose weight or I want to lower my blood pressure. But for him, it was about having energy. And as a side effect, I think he lost 20, 25 pounds and, and a lot of other nice side effects. So he brought this back, talked to it about, uh, to, to some of his, uh, uh, on the executive committee, a few other, Kathy Bullis went through the program, a few other of, of the VPs went through. Ralph went through it a couple of years, a year and a half ago or so now. So, and we had enough feel for it that, you know, something we want to bring to the organization. Because again, I mean, you have all your, your standard wellness programs that you have in place that can get you so far. I mean, it definitely has a positive impact but we wanted to go more and get people intrinsically, okay? Give something to them that they want. So Ralph went through, and then I went through the end of last year, and then Ralph and I both went through the Train the Trainer program. And this year, I think we presented three times, getting ready to do a fourth one here in a couple weeks, where it's a one-day program, and I think we put through about 80 or so area manager level associate, we'll back up a little bit. We actually brought in one of their uh, facilitators that rolled it out to our directors as well. So at this point, we've had, what would you estimate about? Probably 150 to 200? That's about right, yeah. Upper level associates have been through that one day corporate athlete program, and a handful of them that have been through the two and a half day program down in Orlando. Uh, and our, what we're starting to see with this is people are getting a personal benefit from it. So now it's something they're talking to the, their coworkers about, and Obviously, when, when you're happy at home, you're, you're going to be happier at work. So, I mean, it's no different when we, when we trained on safety. We knew that if we could get associates to focus on work safety as well as safety at home, the two are connected. You can't hit the safety switch every time you walk in and out of the door. So if you really focus on being safe at home and here, you, you, you get to where that's just your habits. And really, the whole program has a lot to do with habits as well. But next year, it looks like it's looking good for that we, we are going to be able to uh, move to the next level, and that's our general manager level. So the, the, the general managers of our store equal level here up at corporate to hopefully bring it to as much as 240 associates next year at that level. Uh, and again, it's a program that we put out, that we send a message, here's the, here's the program, we'd love to have you come attend, and we're pretty much selling out every event because the words start to get around the, the benefits of it and so forth. So, does that hit your question? It, it does. Yeah. It does. Thank yeah. you. And, and I, I could go on for a while if you want to. It's, it's just a, it's an awesome program. It's something that you can give them that has benefits on, on both sides of the equation. Yes, sir. Uh, at a certain point, do you sort of take ownership of this program, or, or is that institute still involved throughout the process? We still work closely with them, and there's licensing and so forth for the materials and rollout. But at this point, Ralph and I are presenting these, these courses uh, by, by ourselves. So the first two we did, we had a facilitator in from a corporate athlete program. and uh, But then the last uh, one we did ourselves, and the next one or two we're going to do on our own as well, like Ralph and I co-facilitate. But the support we get from them on them, we just had a conference call with them earlier this week because we're, we're working on some, some uh, uh, sustainability because we don't want to spend all this effort getting it rolled out to people and then abandon them. So we're working on our sustainability program, which, which they give you to begin with. We just wanted to better understand it. So we can pick up the phone, give them a call, and say, hey, you know, we want to set up a, a phone conference. And, and they, they just very supportive. So we're face-to-face -face administering it, but with a lot of support from the corporate athlete group. Where's Santa Rana? Orlando, Florida. Yeah, Human Performance Institute. We do a search on that, corporate athlete. And they have a lot of the materials, the videos, and and, and a newsletter and a, a lot of things that you can sign up for without even going through the program. So if you go to visit, it's got to be a Wawa. <laughs> There's many Wawa. <laughs> right, right on the so list. Back, 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 back to the room. Uh, Hamish, could you talk a little bit more about the uh, that Inspire Others uh, 
initiative that you that you have. Do you how do you communicate that? I mean, to your point, how do you kind of make that part of your corporate culture and to build the sustainability uh, around that program? Because it seems like a really organic kind of ground up, um, you know, very smart, but also common sense approach to it. I mean, can you make it part of an annual review? I mean, what do you do at the manager level to kind of get that message down through the ranks? Uh, repetition, repetition, repetition. I mean, we just, and we hit it from multiple angles. So this Gold Medal Life Awards, it, it was uh, created because we had a couple of associates that had a great story. I won't get into the story. So we said, you know, we do. We know we have more of these stories out there. So we actually have a place where people can go on to my wallet, click on the wellness link, and submit their stories. Uh, and then what we do, we capture that on video with lots of pictures, and then at our quarterly business update meetings that we have incorporated as well as for store GMs, uh, we have the Wawa People video, and that's a big segment within that video. So that's how the stories get shared. But then uh, the last couple weeks, Sabrina, Ralph, and myself have been out hitting uh, area manager, general manager meetings, sharing the stories as well as well solicit, uh, soliciting new stories. We have a monthly tip poster that we put out to the stores that uh, we include stories in, in beyond the, the Gold Medal Life Awards. We do monthly associate features uh, of wellness stories around all, all, all our different fit to fly, so it has to do with having fun or, or moving more, eating right, inspiring others is one of our fit to fly five, and have fun is the fifth one, so lots of different angles we can take on that. We have weekly uh, wellness messages that also include some of our stories, and then the way we communicate is between the videos that we do, but also we have a wellness communication center that, that each store has a fit to fly captain. And that captain is responsible for keeping that communications board updated, uh, uh, orienting new associates around the wellness initiatives they have, uh, the, the culture in, in, in the store, is, as well as uh, awarding what we call wellness goosebumps, where it's a program that we tell you was a corporate recognition program that we took a special card and designated as wellness uh, that they are able to give other associates that have little wellness wins and so forth. But just by getting that information out there with as many channels as we can, and then I'm, my primary uh, uh, function is to be out in stores. I get out to, to, to pretty much, hopefully I'll get down to Florida, but I'll definitely get out to the five states uh, uh, up in the, the, the Mid-Atlantic region and visit them at least one time a year, and that's uh, over 600 stores. But just talking to the associates, getting input from them, it's, it, it's really a lot of, uh, hands-on on our part, but I can only impact so many associates, and that's where the communication piece really, really comes in. So, and I actually have, so I meant to bring them in, or I may have them in my book. I have some of the communication center materials that we use. If you want to take a look at it, I'll, I'll put one out at each table and let you look at it as well. But wait, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Alicia, did you want to add anything? I did, yes, because I thought that was a very, um, very good question that we struggled with even years ago. It was in the safety context. But how do you ingrain it? And um, you would think in an industrial equipment setting, this company represented different um, manufacturers in the, um, oh, the word I'm thinking, um, material handling industry, like crane, uh, road building equipment, forklifts, Heister was their largest supplier at the time, they were the largest dealer of Heister products uh, in on the eastern coast of the United States at 28 locations. So it was a really big operation. And you would, you know, obviously workers' comp expenditures uh, were just huge. But when I worked there in the 1980s, there was a, a period of time that um, it was very difficult to get correct insurance coverages. It was just the tightening of the marketplace. Investments, you know, there was a little bit of a recession, a little bit, <coughs> rather big recession for its time. And all of a sudden, the liability market dried up. And they had a lot of government contracts. If they couldn't get liability insurance, they couldn't bid on the contracts. It was really a matter of survival for them. 
So in thinking through, and by the way, safety and risk management and sort of uh, other, not just benefits, but property casualty insurances were part of my job in HR. You know, they looked at it as a, oh, and by the way, we'll do these little things. Well, over the next few years, it really became the focus of my job. And I was struggling with thinking, you know, we could talk to them, we can do all of that. The way to really have it penetrate is to have them understand what role they play in this. And I'm, I'm a big believer in transparency. I think, you know, if you really want to get someone to buy into something, you've really got to, ex you have to explain it in a way that it resonates and sees it as a relationship to their safety, you know, their own well-being, obviously, but also their job. Not just you have to do it because you're going to be evaluated on it at the end of the year, but more fundamentally in terms of what role they each play in it. So we started at the very beginning. I was fortunate that, you know, since I was at an HR role, when we had employee orientations, I thought, aha, the first thing to do is to get them on day one. When they walk in the door, and make that an integral part of your expectations and what you train them on and what you sort of get them to think about and to see it in the light of, how do I fit into this? And we did it across the board from, we had a, a large group of salespeople, for example, as well as service people, as well as office people. The service were the most at risk in terms of their own safety, as well as um, this liability issue because they would, uh, they would service equipment in, in the facilities of our clients. And so, a huge amount of it was to just get them to understand, come back and tell us what you see there. You know, what is the environment like? Just the way you described that you would walk away from a client if you thought that the workers' comp risk. Now, you know, our sales force would gone crazy if somebody would have said, oh, no, don't sell to them. But there were ways of managing that, obviously, uh, and to sort of set up standards and go out and educate them. And we developed a training program that actually became one of the, the number one um, revenue, you know, because there wasn't a lot of margin in the selling of the equipment. It was the aftermarket parts and service and all of that where this company made its money. And training became huge. And, and so it was a way of really uh, educating the, the customers. But but the service personnel and the training people work very close together, and they really started to embrace that, um, you know, that that way of thinking. Another, I think, interesting that we did something so small, but that had such powerful impact, is we gave every service person, you know, usually went out in a van to work on equipment, we gave them a business card. Now, you would think, you know, most service people don't have a business card; it's only sort of the upper echelon. But the idea that they would leave that card with the customer and it would represent the quality of the work that they did, but also at the same time, an accountability aspect, if you will. Um, and then a final thing that happened, this happened over a couple of years, was that um, we turned the, the organization into a, an employee-owned company. We developed an employee stock ownership plan. And you would be amazed what that does, <laughs> you know? because a large part of their retirement had the, you know, was the uh, stock of the, of the corporation, and they viewed, it makes a huge difference. I know it makes a huge difference at Wawa, and I'm, it made a huge difference in, in our industry as well. And you have to keep it fun. One of the things that I still remember that we did was we created two, you know, again, competition and sort of um, really looking out, we created two, Teams. The entire company was randomly selected into two teams, and we had, and it reminded me of Color War when I was in camp back as a kid. You know, the red team, the blue team, and what we did is for safety and then sort of wins, and we had a newsletter. We publicized all this. This was before the, uh, the internet, and before email. Can you imagine writing that email? Oh, it's glorious. So anyway, um, so. It would build upon itself. We started with one penny, then two pennies, you know, then four, then eight, then, and the prizes at the end of the year, uh, we had random drawings, but everybody in the team got something. And all of a sudden, your coworkers would say, now wait a minute, you know, this is a safety hazard that you're doing there because they all were invested into that team winning. 
So there are sort of fun, innovative things that you can do to get people talking about it. And we sent all that communication to the house because then the spouses and families would see it and they'd get encouragement from the families to reinforce now, you know, we better win because I'm counting on, you know, all these, uh, these prizes. So in, in sort of an established industry, there are still unique, I think, and innovative ways that you can approach that. Thank, thank you. Uh, Ralph? Uh, Do some we'll, questions. Are still in the question segment here? We are. We, we'll take one more question, Ralph, and we'll okay. take it from you. Just for Doug, I know Doug recently went to a presentation talking about the industrial athletes, some of the challenges we face around muscle skeletal issues. Doug, talk a little bit about what you recently learned, especially around the aging workforce and how now safety and wellness really need to come together for a very lot of obvious reasons, especially on some of the muscle skeletal stuff. Yeah, so, so what Ralph's referring to is we went to, um, it was in agenomics, which is a, probably a big topic that's many you've probably heard of, but just the aging workforce. And uh, for us, when we look at our, our risk from a safety perspective, you know, about just over north of 70% of our costs are from slips and falls and musculoskeletal being the number one. And uh, so we look at, we're looking at uh, the risk factors. The risk factors for, for health and wellness impact our musculoskeletal injuries too, so being fit. So we, we've had discussions around you know, industrial athletes from the standpoint of just like when you're going to do work at home that's, that's physical and demanding, you prepare for that, or, or an athletic event where you prepare for that and you get ready. Same thing should be at work as well. So the whole wellness effort and, and getting yourself fit and being prepared for work is really integral into um, it's preventing those injuries. So that's one of the struggles we have is how do we, how do we make that connection that wellness is more than just well-being, it's also gonna keep you safe at work. Uh, so, you know, our, our associates have to do all kinds of things, and most of them are, you know, jacks of many trades, they do everything in the store, so putting away the orders, bringing the product to, to the front line, they're, they're lifting, moving, bending constantly. So, uh, you know, wellness really fits into that, and uh, that's kind of one of our challenges. So, you know, stretching programs, flexibility programs are all good, Hard to fit into our our model with the with the time demand. So, how do we get that to be something they do as, as part of their, their well being, and then when they come to work, that they're ready to go. Uh, and certainly, as uh, even here at our at our manufacturing site, uh, they're well paying jobs. Uh, people are here for a long time. It's a physically demanding job, and they're including myself. We're not getting any younger. So, uh, you know, how do we leverage you know their well being as something that will. Uh, prolong their career and make, the, make their, their retirement years then more, more fruitful. So uh, as far as challenges, that's one that we struggle with and we're, we're trying to work together uh, collaboratively to say, how can we really impact uh, their well-being so that when they come to work, they have that mindset of, of a, an athlete going into competition, same kind of mindset. And I'm prepared, I'm ready to work, and, and that can help me stay safe and, and well. Yeah, thanks. That was perfect. Yeah. Okay. This is great. We're, we're at a point now uh, where we want to move from the panel into the collaborative solutions section. Yeah, and uh, one but Felicia point. wants to say one more thing before one we do that. One tiny point about, uh, I love what that you called it, um, agenomics. You know, the oldest employee at the law firm was a gentleman by the name of Murray Schusterman. And he's 102 years old. Going to work. Still cranking it out. He comes in every single day. He still has clients. It is the most incredible thing. You know, that's one thing about lawyers. They just like never retire. <laughs> oh well. So, somehow he learned, learned to manage the stress there too. Yeah, right? yeah no, he's, he's just amazing. You have to listen to some of the stories. He was, Quite an inspiration. Can you imagine wow. if you're complaining about, you know, my knees hurt and here's the man, 102. So, and a lot of us, retirement is on our, in our plans. So we can afford to retire. Yeah, that, that's and now, you know, taking care of grandkids and it's it's never ending. Well, he could be uh, be oh, he's, he's amazing, truly. And I was there when he said we celebrated a huge affair for his hundredth. Oh, sure. And then um, when I met with my colleague the other day and I asked her, how is Murray? And she goes, we just celebrated 102. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's very impressive. Uh, so we, we I want to thank the panelists for, for their information and, and setting guidance here. We're going to we're now going to move into our collaborative solution sessions, uh, which each of the groups are going to focus on on a topic. And as 
assign a spokesperson, not the panelists, somebody else. Uh, somebody's got to take notes because you're going to have a, a sheet of paper that uh, you're going to write this on. But uh, working from the bottom up, um, Rich, Rich's group, group four, which uh, is back here, um, we want to look at data and metrics and how do you measure the effectiveness of both safety and wellness. And, and more importantly, I mean, as Kathy had noted just a few minutes ago, you know, safety, we, we've got a little bit greater control on that, but how do we measure the effectiveness of wellness? We've heard participation, we've heard other types of metrics, but we want to get, we want to hear some ideas coming out of that group. Uh, group three, uh, Roy is going to facilitate that group. We want to look at the health law. What, what, is, what effect does that have on safety and wellness? Group two, Doug, you're going to take that challenge. Um, and we want to look at what can be learned from safety and be applied to it, whether you're just kicking off your wellness program or it may have been around for 20 years. How do we make it better, looking at uh, what we've learned from safety? Now, Felicia's group, number one, uh, you're going to have a little worksheet that you're going to work with because we got three different safety and wellness models out there that we had mentioned before. We've got uh, what Dow Chemical did, started both groups together. They're unified, lots of metrics. They've had 40 years of, of togetherness, so to speak. Uh, we've got the Train Corporation, where it's very little contact from either group, uh, a bit more of a dysfunctional type of uh, operation. Safeway, two separate departments, but they collaborate with one another. So we want to look at those three types of models and what type of corporate cultures would, uh, would best apply to those. Um, all right, so let's, uh, we want to spend about an hour talking this through. Uh, if you need to take a break, there's still breakfast things yep. outside. Uh, if you wind your way back to the uh, front of the building, that's where the restrooms are. But uh, then quickly make your way back so to, to five minute take a five-minute